When we think of movies, we think of them as a pretty passive form of entertainment. You sit down and simply look at moving images on a screen. You probably react to what you're seeing, but you're not interacting with the movie while watching it. Your actions don't dictate anything that happens in the film, if anything, it's the other way around. But utilizing film in interactive ways is something that has existed almost as long as film has. In the early 1900s, cinematic shooting galleries became an attraction found at carnivals and cinemas. A film was projected onto a screen, and people would fire live rounds at the screen. Really. And I know this sounds like a reach to call that interactive film, but later versions of the concept would implement a mechanism where the gunfire would make the film pause so that players could verify their shots and score their points before the film resumed. It was rudimentary, but it could clearly be described as a person's actions dictating what happens in a film, even if what it's dictating is just an ammunition-based pause button. For something a bit more conventional, albeit even more basic, we can look at the 1967 Czechoslovakian film Kino Automat. Considered the world's first interactive movie, there would be points during screenings of the film where audiences were asked to vote on which of two scenes should play next. The winning scene would then be run, but these choices proved to be pretty superficial, having no real impact on the film's narrative. This was supposedly by design of the filmmaker, Radus Cinchera, as a satirical commentary on democracy, but it was probably also much cheaper to film the illusion of choice, I'm sure. In the mid-70s, we get an example of interactive film that is more game-centric, harkening back to the shooting galleries from decades prior. But instead of using actual guns and actual bullets like some kind of psychopath, this would use a gun-shaped controller and light detection to get the job done. These light guns had been used in many games already, but Nintendo's Wild Gunman would use an actual film reel instead of digital graphics. A film would be run of cowboys doing cowboy things, and then a flash would appear over their eyes when they were about to draw their weapon. Your job was to draw and fire yours faster. If you channeled your inner Greedo and shot first, the game would switch over to an alternate reel depicting your opponent being gunned down. Creation and commercialization of optical media would offer new ways to explore this type of interactivity. Laser discs offered high quality video and audio playback, and also offered the ability to seek specific segments of media off the disc, compared to the linear fashion of playback from other media formats at the time. The first video game to utilize Laserdisc was Sega's Astron Belt, a space shooter that overlaid 2D sprites on top of film footage in a way that seems very confusing and lacks proper feedback. Following this was Data East Genma Taisen, a video game tie-in to an anime film of the same name. This game utilized the laser disc in a similar fashion to Astron Belt, except you could kind of tell what you were shooting at, and if you were actually hitting it. It also included brief scenes from the movie between stages, making it the first game to have full motion video cutscenes as we know them today. We shall confront him in space soon, at OBS 30, the orbiting way station. But the third Laserdisc-based game ever created is probably the best known of them all, and could probably be considered the official birth of the FMV game genre. Dragon's Lair, a fantasy adventure where you become a valiant knight on a quest to rescue the fair princess from the clutches of an evil dragon. Created by Rick Dyer and animated by Don Bluth in his studio, Dragon's Lair brought a visual presentation unlike any game that came before, and it became a huge hit in arcades, seemingly solidifying the idea that FMV games would play a significant role in the future of gaming. But Dragon's Lair came out in 1983, and if you know your video game history, you know that things are about to get really bad for the American market. On top of this, Laserdisc technology was also still new and still expensive. Laserdisc machines were also prone to breaking due to the fact that they weren't actually designed for the level demanded of them for gaming. And while Dragon's Lair was a huge hit at first, after that initial wave of success, people started to lose interest. The gameplay mostly consisted of quick time events and split second decisions, a trial and error guessing game until you'd memorize the entire sequence, after which there was no reason to keep playing. Even follow-ups like Space Ace and Dragon's Lair 2 pretty much just did the same thing, giving people a sense that this type of game 
really had nowhere else to go with its concept and execution. But this doesn't mean that FMV games would completely die off, though. It just meant that other avenues would be explored. VHS and VCRs had already been largely adopted by consumers, so companies decided to see what they could do with that. We'd see some educational products like the Connor Video Smarts and the Bandai Terubiko, which utilized special audio tracks on the VHS tapes to communicate with the consoles. We'd also see a handful of light gun products like Worlds of Wonder's Action Max system and Takata's Video Challenger. But nothing was really catching on. If Laserdisc technology wasn't good enough for interactive films, VHS sure as heck wasn't either. Still, the attempts to explore the possibilities and find some kind of foothold in the market did result in some interesting ideas sometimes, just nothing that could be properly realized beyond a novelty toy you'd be disappointed to receive at Christmas because all you really wanted was an NES. Moving into the late 80s and the early 90s, we'd see the creation of the CD-ROM. Compact discs were originally conceived only for audio playback, but further development now allowed CDs to effectively take the place of the floppy disk in computer systems, with almost 500 times the storage capacity. The gaming industry also jumped on board to take advantage of what CD-ROM could offer. Companies like Sega, Hudson Soft, and even Nintendo started development of CD-ROM attachments for their existing home consoles, while other companies would create whole new CD-based systems. Starting around 1992, we'd start to see the FMV game maker return. Some of the old Laserdisc games for the arcades were now being ported over to CD-ROM, like Cobra Command, Time Gal, and yes, Dragon's Lair. Night Trap, a holdover from attempts at creating VHS-based FMV games, would be released for the Sega CD, and a bit of controversy would be conjured up by some overreacting US senators, which raised the game's profile significantly. This led to the company creating more games in a similar vein, like Ground Zero Texas, Corpse Killer, Double Switch, and more. Notable PC games like Myst and the Seventh Guest incorporated pre-rendered animations and live-action video into their experiences, and were met with critical and commercial success. By demonstrating what could be done with a game's presentation when designed for CD-ROM, they not only played a major role in consumers getting on board with CD-ROM, but also surely inspired many games that would follow. Now, these games weren't really proper FMV games in my opinion. I define FMV game as something that's more of an interactive movie with a heavy, if not exclusive, focus on pre-rendered footage, where your actions dictate what happens in the film. Mist and Seventh Guest and other similar games don't really fit this definition, but some would argue that they very much count as FMV games. What we can all agree on, though, is that full motion video was very prevalent during this period and utilized in various ways to create an experience that people hadn't really seen before. Except for, you know, all those previous times I already mentioned. But this wave, like the ones before, it would die down soon enough. And also, as we'd seen before, another wave would eventually come along. This time thanks to DVD catching on and replacing VHS as the next evolution for home video. Once again, we'd see re-releases of some of those old Laserdisc games, including, you guessed it, Dragon's Lair. I also remember renting a Dungeons & Dragons interactive movie off Netflix, back when you used their service to have movies mailed to you, instead of just letting your membership renew in perpetuity while never actually using it because you've just given up on life. It was in the style of a choose-your-own-adventure book, where the paths would branch and you were given a choice on which path to take. And speaking of choose-your-own-adventure, there was an official interactive movie put out by them, too. There's actually a good handful of interactive films that were released on DVD, but the only other movie I want to make a note of here is one released in 1998 called Tender Love and Care. This was actually made in conjunction with Trilobite, the game studio responsible for the seventh guest. Now we're entering into the time of the 6th and 7th generations of video game consoles, as well as the rise of the gaming PC. What's interesting here is now we're seeing a handful of games coming out that are reminiscent of the FMV game, but without the FMV part. Technology had gotten to the point where instead of using full motion video, more content was being rendered in-engine. Graphically, things were looking more detailed with smoother animation and higher frame rates without the need to fall back on pre-rendered video to compensate. 
Gameplay-wise, Shenmue, God of War, and Resident Evil 4 are all examples of games that featured quick-time events. Bouncer is an early PS2 title with branching paths explored based on decisions you make and characters you play as. You have your Heavy Rain and your Walking Dead and other games with an emphasis on your choices having an impact on the narrative. There's also a bunch of games with morality mechanics that let you play your character as varying levels of dickhead and seeing the consequences of doing so. I know you can't trace all of this back to the influence of FMV games. I haven't even touched upon visual novels, for example. But the point I'm trying to make is that video games were evolving to a point that now seemed to surpass what FMV games had originally offered that made them stand out. A cinematic experience. And so it seemed almost as if there was no real place for FMV games anymore. Except there totally was, and is, a place for FMV games. The genre has carved out a niche for itself and scratches a specific itch for people looking for that specific experience. Its limitations, compared to other games, is part of its charm, and also seen as a stylistic choice, rather than a shortcoming of the genre. Kind of like how you still see sprite-based graphics used for some games, even though technology now lets people lovingly render horse testicles in excruciating detail. And the improvements in technology have allowed modern FMV games to improve as well, whether it be more detailed stories and branching paths due to increased storage capacities, or new ways to incorporate gameplay and interacting with the video due to better hardware. So while you could see FMV games as a genre working within limitations, those limitations are not as... um... limiting as they were 30 years ago. So I just kind of want to mess around and play a bunch of FMV games, just kind of celebrate the genre and look at a bunch of games, new and old, good and bad. And I figure the best way to do this would be to force a bunch of my friends to come along for the ride. James plays game with me.